So in this video, I want to talk about T helper cells. So T helper cells, which are differentiated from the CD4 T cell, are big helpers of the immune system. And they are the major commanders. And they are going to determine which kind of army you want to mobilize. So there are three big commanders. These are the TH17, TH1 cell, or the TH2 cells. And you can think about that. It depends on how you're attacked. If you are attacked by the sea, you want to send off the commander that oversees the Navy. If you're attacked by the air, you want to send off the commander of the Air Force. So you can think about them, the big commanders of the immune system, because they have a game plan. So let's look first and describe this different T helper cells to understand what their plan is going to be. So here we have the TH17 cell, one type of T helper cell. Then we have a T helper 1 and a T helper 2 cell. So the T helper 17 cell can secrete R17. That's kind of handy to also remember that the T helper 17 makes R17. R17 is very good for help activating neutrophils. It also will make R6, and R6 obviously drives inflammation. And if you have more inflammation, you're also going to get more neutrophils in. So obviously, there's always crosstalk, so that's also going to help here. Then the T helper 1 cell makes tons of interferon gamma. And interferon gamma is a very important macrophage activator. Also, it helps with class switching to IgG. T helper 1s also make R2, which can help to differentiate CD8 T cells, help them proliferate. And then there's T helper 2, which makes R4. It helps us to class switch to IgE. And then there's it makes R5, which helps particularly is eosinophils. The question is now first, if these are the big commanders and the helpers, I mean, they have all this helper in their name, where are they helping? Because right now they are made in the lymph node. So right now we are in the lymph node, but we want to know where all this help is going to happen. If you are activating neutrophils, then the help is actually happening in the periphery. And obviously this is also going to true for the inflammation. If you're going to activate macrophages, the help is also going to happen in the periphery. The class switch is definitely happening in lymph nodes, as you can see. I mean, that's where class switching happens. So for this, the T helper cell doesn't need to leave. The lymph node is also the place where it helps activate the T cells and helps them proliferate. And then for the T helper 2 cell, we're going to see that class switching obviously also happens in the lymph node. And if we are, we're going to see that the eosinophils help us predominantly when we're infected with worms. So we're also going to help us in the periphery. And I have now just chosen a gut because that's most likely that we're going to encounter the worm. For all the other ch scenarios where I just say periphery, it would be at the site of infection. And I always like to use the example that we hit a nail in our feet. So this is going to be the example for periphery that we're going to use. So the first thing that we need to realize is that the help happens at different places and that will also determine where this T helper cell needs to go because the T helper cell, the T helper 17 cell needs to go into the periphery in order to do this. It doesn't help us if it stays in the lymph node. The T helper 1 cell needs to go into the periphery to do the macrophage activation, but all the other things can happen in the lymph node. And the T helper 2 cell helps us also a lot in the lymph node. But then if we would be infected with a worm, and we're going to get to that, then it would need to go back to the site of infection, which would be then probably the gastrointestinal tract. So now we have discussed what these different types of T helper cells do and where they help. And what I want to next discuss is how do we get there? So how do we get these different types of T helper cells? So you all know that they differentiate from a naive CD4 T cell. So we have this naive CD4 T cell that can get activated and then will differentiate into these three kinds of T effector cell, the T helper cell.
So one important thing that I want to mention is that you're always going to get a mixture of those. You're never going to get just one. So this naive CD4 T cell, once it gets activated, it will become all of these helpers. But one is going to be the most important and one is going to be dominating because you want to have a plan in mind. So now we need somebody to tell this naive CD4 T cell in which of these different helpers it should differentiate or which would be the most important commander that it should differentiate into. And obviously this naive CD4 T cell sits in the lymph node. So therefore we need somebody that fights at the battlefront where the infection is to come and tell it what to do. And this is going to be, as you're probably already expecting, the dendritic cell. So let's go back at the battlefront where we are fighting the infection for example, in the big toe, and look at the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell is this huge wiggle which I have drawn here, and we are now here in the periphery. And the dendritic cell is this observer. The observer will kind of have an idea with which type of pathogen we are infected with. And we can put the pathogen into several categories extracellular bacteria and yeast because they are kind of handled similarly in terms of the immune response, intracellular bacteria like TB and viruses, or helminths. So if the dendritic cell is here in the periphery and kind of figures out what's going on, this is a cell that observes and can determine what the invader is. How does it determine this? Well, it determines this with its pattern recognition receptors, which are found on the surface, in the endosome, in the cytoplasm, and can kind of figure out what group, what the problem is, just a group. They cannot tell specifics, but they can just say, okay, this is an extracellular bacteria, yeast, intracellular bacteria, virus, helminth, so kind of this pathogen groups. If you are infected with one of those, the dendritic cell will start making cytokines, and I have listed them here. So if you are threatened by extracellular bacterial yeast, the dendritic cell will start making TGF beta and R6. If it's intracellular bacterial virus, it will start making R12. If it's a helmet, it will start making R4. Well, it's going to start making it, but then it will make its way to the lymph node and will not stop making it. In the lymph node, it will meet this naive CD4 T cell. And if it recognizes the peptide, this naive T cell with its T cell receptor recognizes the peptide that this dendritic cell is presenting, and there's also co-stimulation. Then the dendritic cell will continue to make these cytokines, and these cytokines will determine which kind of T helper cells I'm going to get. This will determine which, what is my big game plan that I have in mind. And this is what the dendritic cell basically communicates to the naive T cell once those interact. And this should also make sense because if you are threatened by extracellular bacteria, what is your best thing that you can do? Well, eat them up with neutrophils. So your dendritic cell secretes TGF beta and R6, you're going to mainly make TH17. If you are threatened by an intracellular bacteria, maybe TB, your dendritic cell makes R12, you're going to get a TH1 mainly because your best guess is to fight TB with super activated macrophages because I had this extra interferon gamma here. And if you're threatened by helminths, your dendritic cell is going to make R4. And then obviously you want to have eosinophils and also want to have IgE antibody, which can help in the defense against helminths. And now the only other thing what I want to discuss is how is the help happening in terms of lymph node versus periphery? I think the periphery is very easy, but now I want to talk a little bit more about what is happening in terms of help in the lymph node. So let's look at the lymph node and let's see how the different T helper cells can help in the lymph node. One very important thing is that the T helper cells generally can help activate a B cell, a naive B cell, which are hanging out in the lymph node to activate, to give this co-stimulation to become a plasma cell. So a plasma cell is the B effector cell, which is going to secrete antibody. And it's going to secrete first the IgM type. That's the first antibody in place. So we need 
cause stimulation in order to get the naive B cell into a plasma cell. And that's a job of the T helper cell. And this job can be facilitated by a Th1 cell and a Th2 cell. And the Th2 secretes IL-4 and IL-5, and that helps to do the job. And the Th1 secretes interferon gamma, and that helps do the job. You should realize that the Th17 cannot do that. And that also makes sense because we said the Th17 goes back, so it's, it's gone. But those guys hang around in the lymph node and can help with this step. We help the B cell to become a plasma cell with this core stimulation. After, of course, you have antigen that activates the B cell and gave it signal 1. So you got co-stimulation, but now you have a plasma cell that just makes IgM. And obviously at one point we want to have better antibodies. So at one point we want to have this plasma cell to class switch and produce, for example, IgG or and IgA or and IgE, because these are just better antibodies. IgM is a huge molecule, it doesn't get everywhere, it can also not do so many effector functions, it can actually only activate complement, that's about it. These can do way, way more fancy stuff. We want to take this plasma cell and make form a, what is called, germinal center. This is a place where class switch recombination happens, so where we can switch the antibody class to from an IgM to an IgG, IgA or and or IgE. So how do we make this switch? This happens in the germinal center and you need another very specific helper cell to form this germinal center and this is called the T follicular helper cell and this helps with the formation of the germinal center. So now, how do we get this T follicular helper cell there? Well, it's just a, another kind of T helper cell, and it's a differentiating T helper cell. Maybe some of those guys, once they are starting to differentiate into Th1 or Th2, they just got into this lineage of T follicular helper cell. And the T follicular helper cell forms a germinal center. We are still in the lymph node, though that's in the lymph node. You form a germinal center and there a plasma cell can then class switch to IgG, IgA and or IgE. Now the next question that we need to ask is, how do we decide which antibodies we want to make? And who decides that? There's actually two inputs that are going to decide which type of antibodies we're going to make. The number one input are cytokines. So cytokines are one very important input. Because we have now here, we got already the help of the Th1 cells or the Th2 cells to make a plasma cell. So you can imagine there's still the cytokines around. If we have a lot of interferon gamma around, we're going to class switch to IgG. If there is a lot of IL-4 around, we're going to class switch to IgE. So we are still in the lymph node, in the germinal center, so these cytokines can get there. But there's another input. How, when will we ever get IgA? IgA is the antibody that is made depending on the location of the lymph node. So if we are here in mucosa, lymph node, lymph nodes or malt because associated lymphoid tissue, these cells there can make TGF beta. And TGF beta is going to drive the class switching to IgA. So now you can see the following, that actually there's two inputs, but one is based on the location. We're only going to get IgE when we're, uh, when we're dealing with mucosal lymph nodes or mold, but the other class switches are driven by cytokines that are secreted by the T helper cell. One thing that I also want to mention about these different antibodies types, that this is obviously not an exclusive story, so you're not going to get only IgG, only IgA or IgE, so you're always going to get a mixture. And the other thing what I want to mention is that IgE is never the main player, so you get just a little extra IgE if you would be infected with a worm, but you get normally always all the different types of antibodies. This concludes the video on the different T helper subtypes.